The Society of the Spectacle by Guy Debord, Chapter Seven, Territorial Management. Whoever becomes the ruler of a city that is accustomed to freedom and does not destroy it, can expect to be destroyed by it, for it can always find a pretext for a rebellion in the name of its former freedom and age-old customs, which are never forgotten despite the passage of time or any benefits it has received. No matter what the ruler does or what precautions he takes, the inhabitants will never forget that freedom, or those customs, unless never forget that freedom or those customs, unless they are separated or dispersed. That was a quote from Machiavelli from *The Prince*. One sixty-five, capitalist production has unified space, breaking down the boundaries between one society and the next. This unification is at the same time an extensive and intensive process of banalization. Just as the accumulation of commodities mass-produced for the abstract space of the market shattered all regional and legal barriers, and all the medieval guild restrictions that maintained the quality of craft production, it also undermined the autonomy and quality of places. This homogenized Homogenizing power is the heavy artillery that has battered down all the walls of China. One sixty-six. The free space of commodities is constantly being modified and rebuilt in order to become ever more identical to itself, to get as close as possible to motionless monotony. One sixty-seven. While eliminating geographical distance. This society produces a new internal distance in the form of spectacular separation. One sixty-eight. Tourism, human circulation packaged for consumption, a byproduct of the circulation of commodities, is the opportunity to go and see what has been banalized. The economic organization of travel to different places already guarantees their equivalence. The modernization that has eliminated the time involved in travel has simultaneously eliminated any real space from it. One sixty nine. The society that reshapes its entire surroundings has evolved its own special technique for molding its very territory, which constitutes the material underpinning for all the facets of this project. Urbanism, city planning. Is capitalism's method for taking over the natural and human environment, following its logical development toward total domination, capitalism now can and must refashion the totality of space into its own particular decor. One seventy, the capitalist need that is satisfied by ur urbanism's conspicuous petrification of life can be described in Hegelian terms as a total predominance of a peaceful coexistence. Within space, over the restless becoming that takes place in the progression of time. One seventy one. While all the technical forces of capitalism contribute toward various forms of separation, urbanism provides the material foundation for those forces, and prepares the ground for their deployment. It is the very technology of separation. One seventy two. Urbanism is the modern method for solving the ongoing problem of safeguarding class power by atomizing workers, who had been dangerously brought together by the conditions of urban production. The constant struggle that has had to be waged against anything that might lead to such coming together has found urbanism to be its most effective field of operation. The efforts of all the established powers since the experiences of the French Revolution to increase the means of maintaining law and order in the streets have finally culminated in the suppression of the streets. Describing what he terms a one-way system, Louis Mumford points out that, with the present means of long-distance mass communication, sprawling isolation has proved an even more effective method of keeping a population under control. But the general trend toward isolation, which is the underlying essence of urbanism, must also include a controlled reintegration of the workers in accordance with the planned needs of production and consumption. The reintegration into the system means bringing isolated individuals together as isolated individuals. Factories, cultural centers, tourist resorts, and housing developments 
are specifically designed to foster this type of pseudo community. The same collective isolation prevails even within the family cell, where the omnipresent receivers of spectacular messages fill the isolation with the dominant images, images that derive their full power precisely from that isolation. 173. In all previous periods, architectural innovations were designed exclusively for the ruling classes. Now, for the first time, a new architecture has been designed specifically for the poor. The aesthetic poverty and vast proliferation of this new experience in habitation stem from its mass character, which character in turn stems both from its function and from the modern conditions of construction. The obvious core of these conditions is the authoritarian decision-making which abstractly converts the environment into an environment of abstraction. The same architecture appears everywhere as soon as industrialization has begun, even in the countries that are furthest behind in this regard, as an essential foundation for implanting the new type of social existence. The contradiction between the growth of society's material powers and the continued lack of progress toward any conscious control of those powers is revealed as glaringly by the developments of urbanism as by the issues of thermonuclear weapons or genetic modification, where the possibility of manipulati manipulating heredity is already on the horizon. 174. The self-destruction of the urban environment is already well underway. The explosion of cities into the countryside, covering it with what Mumford calls a formless mass of thinly spread semi-urban tissue, is directly governed by the imperatives of consumption. The dictatorship of the automobile, the pilot product of the first, first stage of commodity abundance, has left its mark on the landscape with the dominance of freeways, which tear up the old urban centers and promote an ever wider dispersal. Within this process, various forms of partially recon reconstituted urban fabric fleetingly crystallize around distribution factories, giant shopping centers erected in the middle of nowhere and surrounded by acres of parking space. These temples of frenetic consumption are subject to the same irresistible centrifugal momentum, which casts them aside as soon as they have engendered enough of surrounding development to become overburdened secondary centers in their turn. But the technical organization of consumption is only the most visible aspect of the general process of decomposition that has brought the city to the point of consuming itself. 175. Economic history, whose entire previous development centered around the opposition between city and country, has now progressed to the point of nullifying both. As a result of the current paralysis of any historical development apart from the independent movement of the economy, the incipient disappearance of city and country does not represent a transcendence of their separation, but their simultaneous collapse. The mutual erosion of city and country, resulting from the failure of the historical movement through which existing urban reality could have been overcome, is reflected in the eclectic mixture of their de decomposed fragments that blanket the most industrialized regions of the world. 176. Universal history was born in cities, and it reached maturity with the city's decisive victory over the country. For Marx, one of the greatest revolutionary merits of the bourgeoisie was the fact that it subjected the country to the city, whose very air is liberating. But if the history of the city is a history of freedom, it is also a history of tyranny, a history of state administrations controlling not only the countryside, but the cities themselves. The city has been the historical battleground of the struggle for freedom, but it is yet to host its victory. The city is the focal point of history because it embodies both a concentration of social power, which is what makes historical enterprises possible, and a consciousness of the past. The current destruction of the city is thus merely one more reflection of humanity's failure thus far to subordinate the economy to historical consciousness of society's failure to unify itself by reappropriating the powers that have been alienated from it. 177. The country represents the complete opposite, isolation and separation. 
As urbanism destroys the cities, it recreates a pseudo countryside devoid both of the natural relations of the traditional countryside and of the direct and directly challenged social relations of the historical city. The conditions of habitation and spectacular control in today's planned environment have created an artificial neo-peasantry. The geographical dispersal and the narrow-mindedness that have always prevented the peasantry from undertaking independent action and becoming a creative historical force are equally characteristic of these modern producers, for whom a world of their own making is, an inaccessible as, is as inaccessible as were the natural rhythms of work in agrarian societies. The peasantry was the steadfast foundation of oriental despotism in that its inherent fragmentation gave rise to a natural tendency toward bureaucratic centralization. The neo-peasantry produced by the increasing bureaucratization of the modern state differs from the old peasantry in that its apathy must now be historically manufactured and maintained. Natural ignorance has been replaced by the organized spectacle of falsifications. The new cities inhabited by this technological pseudo-peasantry are a glaring expression of the repression of historical time on which they have been built. Their motto could be, nothing will ever happen here, and nothing ever has. The forces of historical absence have begun to create their own landscape because historical liberation, which must take place in the cities, has not yet occurred. 177 or 178. The history that threatens this twilight world could potentially subject space to a directly experienced time. Proletarian revolution is this critique of human geography through which individuals and communities will be able to create places and events commensurate with the appropriation no longer just of their work, but of their entire history. The ever-changing playing field of this new world and the freely chosen variations in the rules of the game will, re will regenerate a diversity of local scenes that are independent without being insular, thereby reviving the possibility of authentic journeys, journeys within an, an authentic life that is itself understood as a journey containing its whole meaning within itself. 179. The most revolutionary idea concerning urbanism is not itself urbanistic, technological, or aesthetic. It is the project of reconstructing the entire environment in accordance with the needs of the power of workers' councils, of the anti-state dictatorship of the proletariat, of executory dialogue. Such councils, which can be effective only if they transform existing conditions in their entirety, cannot set themselves any lesser task if they wish to be recognized and to recognize themselves in a world of their own making.